present to you a video from the International Association of Firefighters. 100 years ago, Babe Ruth pitched a shutout to help the Red Sox beat the Cubs in the World Series. An influenza pandemic swept the globe, and the war to end all wars ended. 1918 also marked formation of the International Association of Firefighters. Today, mayors, local firefighters, and the IAFF share a common goal as partners in protecting our neighborhoods. The notion of America as a nation of neighborhoods runs deep in our popular imagery. Central to the patchwork foundation of cities and towns is a place where people there are ready to help, the firehouse. Firefighters literally live in our neighborhoods. So if you want to find something that's going on in a neighborhood, ask a firefighter. Each firehouse stands as a light that never goes out, where the number of the firefighters inside can make the difference in life and death situations. The community sees our firefighters as people who respond simply because not only are they trained to be firefighters, but they're also trained and certified paramedics. When you hear that siren, you know, first of all, that there's a very highly trained, highly skilled, motivated firefighter or EMS person on the way to help out that individual who's in distress. As part of expanding the station, we receive the ISO 1 rating. It all comes into play with where we locate the equipment in the neighborhoods as well as the business districts and how they're uh, able to uh, respond. Firefighters see America at 2 a.m. This opioid crisis that's been going around our country right now is a perfect example of how our team gets on site, administers Narcan, brings people back to life. Firefighters are neighbors helping neighbors. Our fire stations are housed literally right there in our communities, ready at a moment's notice to respond to an emergency call. And so the relationship extends beyond emergency calls. They're right there at the same shopping at the same grocery stores. They're right there at the same churches. They're right there talking to the children at the schools. They're right there walking in the neighborhoods. They raise money, uh, they, give, they give to charity, uh, and they, they do things above and beyond uh, the day-to-day -day work of being a firefighter. The IAFF works with local firefighters and their cities to secure federal SAFER and FIRE Act grants to meet safe staffing levels, fund equipment, and deliver frontline training. The SAFER grant allows us to hire personnel, and if Washington isn't listening, they need to hear how important the SAFER grant is for local governments. You know, th these grants are really important for us to make sure we've got the very best equipment, not only to protect our community, but to protect the firefighters as well. Technology is changing all the time, we're learning new things all the time, so it's really important that we've got a national organization like IAFF that is com combining all of the national learning so that we can spread those back out. The IAFF and IAFF members stand with those who protect our neighborhoods through support of public safety. There is nothing more important as mayor than public safety and neighborhood revitalization. Right at the crux of that are firefighters who not only serve our communities but live in our communities. It's very important in it that they're noticed in our neighborhoods and that the residents realize they're close to them and they have the ability to get in a few minutes to whatever need there is. Firefighters and EMS workers both are, are the face of the city to many, many residents. As mayors, there's so much we have to know and so much we have to learn. And the more practical application we get about the things that we're responsible for, I think it makes us better mayors. Anytime you're going to um, talk to someone about what they do, it's better to walk in their shoes. It's all about partnership. One, you want them to recognize that they're appreciated. But most importantly, more than even feeling appreciated, you want to also make sure that they have the greatest and the best resources and technology to do their job. For me, it's important to get in the trench with them you know, and see the pressure that they're under, the decision-making that they have to do uh, on a split second, um, and the pressure that, that they ultimately have to perform under so that our residents can be saved. When we had budget problems recently, uh, we had to go and ask the residents for a millage increase in order to keep those firehouses open. And the people who particularly lived in those neighborhoods that, that would have been affected said, we bought our house here 
so that we could be close to these firehouses. It's important about making sure we have the right equipment, making sure we have the, the right training, making sure that we have the right amount of firefighters and making sure that they're in the right locations because literally seconds makes a difference. I think it makes the citizens feel more secure if there's a firehouse near them. It sends a message that safety, security is important in our community. Firefighters come from our neighborhood, so this is our, these are our neighbors, these are our brothers and sisters. To know that every neighborhood has right there you know, somebody who can protect your loved ones, your home, uh, everything that makes life worth living. Uh, that's why having neighborhood fire stations is so critical. Opportunities like this to know what firefighters go through every day um, will make us better and, and it helps us to advocate more on their behalf because we truly understand what it is they do every single day. I'm gonna leave here knowing I gotta do everything I can to make sure that they have the right equipment, that they have the right training, that they have the right uh, resources to, to keep our residents safe. I'm gonna go home and have a better respect for our firefighters without a doubt and I think there's, there shouldn't be a mayor uh, that doesn't want that to happen. America's mayors and professional firefighters have been woven together into the public safety fabric of our communities for more than a century. We are partners in protecting our neighborhoods, our neighbors, and keeping our communities safe. Thank you. It looks like Fire Ops was an incredible success. And um, how about the production team for turning that around so quickly, guys? Wasn't that impressive? Very impressive. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our City Livability Luncheon. It's time for the annual City Livability Awards presentation. Um, each year, the City Livability Awards honor mayors for exemplary leadership and commitment to enhancing the quality of life in America's cities. Uh, these award-winning programs represent some of the most creative and dynamic programs that are truly transforming our cities for the past 29 years. Waste Management Incorporated has sponsored this much-appreciated program because of the high value waste management places on helping our communities be stronger, better, and safer places. Uh, we're extremely grateful uh, for their support and their partnership, which makes this wonderful program possible. I'm very pleased at this time to introduce Susan Moulton, uh, she's the Corporate Director of Public Sector Solutions at Waste Management Incorporated, uh, who will announce our 2018 City Livability Award winners. Susan, welcome to this 86th Annual Conference of Mayors, and, and thank you for your support of this fantastic program. Thank you, Mayor Benjamin. You've done a tremendous job leaving, leading the conference and, of course, your city, which we have the privilege of serving. Waste Management and the U.S. Conference of Mayors have had a long partnership, and we wish both you and Mayor Burnett the best of luck in leading the Conference of Mayors. Also, thank you, Mayor Walsh, for hosting us in this beautiful city of yours, Boston. Tom Cochran, with your day-to-day -day leadership as the Conference of Mayors CEO and Executive Director, we know that this conference would not be possible without you, so I salute you, too. Waste management is just thrilled to be associated with these awards that recognize worthy programs to improve the quality of life in our cities. We know that many of you have sustainability, recycling, and waste diversion goals, and we stand ready to serve you and help you achieve those objectives. Let's move to the awards on your table. Let's move to the awards on your table. <laughs> There are City Livability Award recipient brochures with descriptions of all the 2018 winners. Please turn to the screens above and you will see the names of all the cities below 100,000 population, honorable mention, and outstanding achievement award winners. There are four mayors who have been recognized for honorable mention and five mayors who have been recognized for outstanding achievement awards in each of the large and small city categories. But before I announce the small city's first place winner, let's recognize each of these other award-winning mayors by giving them a round of applause. And the winner of the first place award for small cities is Mayor
Craig Thurman of Broken Arrow for the Savings Historic Downtown Birth of the Rose District. In Broken Arrow, we use the phrase where opportunity lives. And the Rose District is a good example of how that works. When we started, there was just nothing there, and now there's so much opportunity for people to be able to, to grow and do things. This really became a sense of community that we've developed. So how's business, good? 2004, when there was a downturn in the downtown and a lot of businesses had left, a committee formed together and they worked with the city to create the concept of needing to redevelop the downtown. And from that concept came the Rose District. We put up around $20 million of public investment. We've had over $60 million of private investment. The people that live in Broken Arrow can be proud of their investments because without the commitment of the citizens, it wouldn't have happened. I think all the changes are incredible. When you have the farmer's market, there's just people everywhere. And then afterwards, we will go sit downtown and have lunch. So it's great to see the community all come together. We actually just went down to one car because we do all of our you know, shopping and things, we just walk. <laughs> so yeah, it's a really great atmosphere. About six or seven years ago, we were under uh, $10,000 in terms of sales tax being generated. At the end of 2017, we had over $400,000 worth of sales tax. I'm always happy when I drive around at noon or at dinner time and, and I cannot find a parking place because I know that that means people are down here enjoying themselves and it's really exciting. I really want to thank Waste Management and the Conference of Mayors for winning this Livability Award. Every day is not a parade, but what we're doing here every day is a celebration. I think it's just gonna to continue to grow. It's very exciting when you think of all the possibility, what's gonna happen here. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in congratulating Broken Arrow Mayor Greg Thurman. Thank you. Well, I, I want to congratulate all the mayors that were mentioned for this honor. Uh, so it's, it's such a great honor to receive this award. And this morning when President Benjamin did his acceptance speech. He made the statement that the two most powerful words in the, Ameri in the English language are thank you. And I want to sincerely say thank you to the U.S. Conference of Mayors, to President Benjamin, and to Waste Management for this award. It's quite an honor for our city to receive. About 10 years ago, we came up with the tagline, where opportunity lives. The Broken Arrow is that city where opportunity lives. And our downtown was very dilapidated. We really didn't have anyone that wanted to live there, no one, there was no opportunity there, and it was dying. I often say that if your car was parked on a Saturday night in Main Street Broken Arrow, it's because it wouldn't start. <laughs> the, uh, we've really changed the dynamics in downtown. And what we have done with partnerships with our community, with our citizens, uh, has this really been amazing. And it's been a very successful P3 that we work with our private sector and we've really developed this area. So we've created this really vibrant community and we look at the stats uh, that we, how we have changed things. The one thing that, uh, a couple things that jump out, the fact that we have now added 70 new businesses, we have uh, over a thousand new jobs and as was stated in the video, we, we went from just six years ago, we were around 18,000 and in 2017, we had 400,000, over $400,000 in sales tax raise. So it's been very successful for our community. A vibrant place for us uh, to be, and it's something that uh, we have such opportunity for the future, and the challenges are bright for Broken Arrow, and, and I want to thank everyone again for this award. Thank you.
And now we move to the large city category, that is cities with population of 100,000 and greater. First, here are the mayors that have received the honorable mention and outstanding achievement awards. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. And the winner of the Large City First Place City Livability Award is Tampa Mayor Bob Buckhorn for the Stay and Play Program. kids an opportunity to get off the street and to get away from having to make bad choices that lead to bad outcomes. Our obligation is to give them a fair shot. Put them in a place where they would be happy, that they would be safe, that they would be under the mentorship and the guidance of adults who care about them. This is something that every mayor in America could do. It's a financial investment for sure. It's not without its challenges, but I would tell you uh, our community is a safer place as a result of us having done this. There are kids that are alive today that might not have been. Receiving the kind of direction and role models that they need in their life. Just being kids and Love it. The dollars that we invest in this project are dollars that I'm not investing in law enforcement, not investing in corrections, not investing in parole officers, not investing in picking up the paper and reading about another 14 year old who's been shot in a drive by shooting. It's wonderful that we have corporate supporters like Waste Management. Uh, we have conferences like this with the Livability Award uh, to recognize mayors that are doing great stuff, the mayors are making a difference, mayors that are creating public policy that is meaningful, that is long-lasting. When I look back on my seven plus years as mayor, this will turn out to be one of the most significant, meaningful, impactful things that I have done. Would you like to the Buccaneers mayor? Mayor! Mayor! you have the ability as a mayor to change a life, to shape a life, to save a life, and by gosh, that ought to be what you get up every day to do. First of all, to Waste Management, thank you for recognizing Tampa in this case, but my many colleagues that are here and you've been doing this for years and we appreciate it. Mayors share a special bond and the projects and the programs that we do like Stay and Play could be easily done in your communities. And I will tell you, as our communities rise, we also have an obligation to lift. Lift people out of poverty, lift people out of circumstances, lift people out of potentially dangerous situations. And what you saw in that video is no different in any of your communities. I will tell you the 175,000 visits that we have had to our parks and recreation centers as they have stayed open till midnight, seven days a week, has saved lives. I can tell you with certainty that there are young men and women that are alive today because they were in our facilities under the guidance of people that love them and that take care of them and that mentor them. Getting them off the streets and the seduction of the guns and the gangs and the violence. They're not victims because we had them under our protective covering. It's made a difference in my community. And I can tell you it has made a difference in the lives of those young people that you saw on that screen and multiply that by thousands. It's made a lives for those single moms who were, 
working two and three jobs to put food on the table and to try to raise their families right, but can't be there all the time, and those kids are home alone. It's made a difference. And that's what mayors do. That's why we're mayors. We don't run for office to be. We run for office to do. Now, let's get it done. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Susan. Congratulations for a job well done, Mayor Buckhorn. And congratulations to all mayors who've received this year's City Livability Awards. And thank you to all the mayors for developing programs that can be replicated and adapted throughout the U.S. And now, Mayor Benjamin, I return the program back to you. Another round of applause for all our winners, please. That was exciting. Uh, before we bring up Major League Baseball for our 2018 uh, Play Ball Summer announcement, I'd like to have all of you just turn to the uh, video for a, a very short uh, presentation. Play Ball is a wonderful partnership between Major League Baseball and nearly 300 mayors from all across the country introducing and reintroducing baseball to communities all across America. Y'all gonna have some fun, all right? It's been an exciting opportunity to take some of our young people and introduce them to the sport that so many of us knew and, and loved growing up. Shoot. Baseball teaches teamwork. It teaches leadership. Baseball is also a place that, that teaches a great deal of humility. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I love being on third base. Uh, but I'm not sure I ever really had the skill set to be on third base then, so. <laughs> Mayors should get involved with play ball. We speak to the, to the hopes and dreams of an entire city. So us building this wonderful partnership with Major League Baseball has allowed us to open up doors of opportunity to our children, wherever they are, whoosever they are. You have a good time, all right? I'll see you again sometime in the summer. It's been a wonderful opportunity to help build a community. It's so important uh, that we work together every single day to build this American ethos where people know that if you work hard, if you play hard, you play together, you develop teamwork and leadership skills, then everyone has a chance to make it in this country. continue making these investments in them, I believe that we're going to change this country and change the world. Play ball. That was a lot of fun. I had that day playing baseball with the kids. I want to encourage all of you, if you haven't done a play ball event, consider doing one in your city. It is, it is edifying in so many different ways. Um, I'm pleased uh, to have with us today Tom um, Brussel. Uh, from the Major League Baseball to give us an update on our play ball program. He serves as Major League ba Baseball's Vice President of Community Affairs. Uh, please welcome Tom. Thank you, Mayor. And I am again honored to be here on behalf of Major League Baseball to celebrate our joint play ball efforts. On behalf of Commissioner Manford and all of Major League Baseball, thanks to all of the mayors many in this room for hosting play ball events. In January, Commissioner Manfred and Jim Clark, the president of Boys and Girls Clubs of America, committed the support of local Boys and Girls Clubs to play ball and efforts and initiatives. Uh, you see one of the mayor events here uh, with Boys and Girls Club kids. I am pleased to report that due in great part to the collaborative efforts of Major League Baseball, mayors across the country and Boys and Girls Clubs, play ball events have been scheduled for all 50 states the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. Through our collective efforts, thousands of young people and families will come together for another play ball summer. I understand that we are on pace to have a record number of mayors host events, so if you haven't already signed up, please do not hesitate to do so. All mayors who sign up will receive this 
official Rawlings Major League Baseball Play Ball Baseball. And we've also, this year, kind of revamped our shirts, uh, which the kids get at Play Ball events, but it's got the Conference of Mayors logo, Play Ball, and on the back, it says, I am a Play Ball kid. So, please sign up. The Play Ball Initiative is our sport's largest effort to encourage kids to be active and play our great game. The beauty of the national pastime is that it can be played in many ways, and we're adding more ways all the time to engage children. For instance, we recently introduced Hit and Run Baseball, which introduces different varieties of the game to help focus kids on playing at a quicker pace and on focusing on their development. No partner is more effective are important in spreading the important message of getting kids to play and be active and bringing the love of the game to communities around the country than those of you who are in this room. We are so grateful for your support and look forward to many more years of partnership. I also have the extreme pleasure to introduce someone here today who is somewhat of a, a legend in Boston sports history. Most people know that the Red Sox spent 86 years uh, in a Red Sox in a World Series drought, or some people call it a curse, but that curse was ended in 2004, when they uh, swept the St. Louis Cardinals in four games. Each of those games, sure. <laughs> each of those games uh, was ended by their closer, Keith Folk. He got the win in the first game, he saved the final game. He also was a 2003 American League leader in saves and a 2003 All-Star. Please join me in welcoming Keith Folk. Keith is going to be around a little bit after the luncheon uh, at the Playball booth one fo floor down for some photos and, and for some autographs. So please join us there. Again, thank you so much for your support. It means the world to us, and it means the world to kids who are play playing ball across the country. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Tom, and thank you, Major League Baseball, for your support of this wonderful program. If you haven't done so already, please stop by the play ball area and get registered for this year's program. You can even get your uh, baseball trading card picture made as well. So um, I'd like to now uh, bring to the uh, stage uh, Mayor Hillary Sheevy of Reno, Nevada, the chair of our standing committee on tourism, arts, parks, entertainment, and sports, who's going to be speaking about Burning Man. I uh, remember at the uh, winter meeting, she extended an invitation for all of us to attend. So uh, please, Mayor Sheevy. Thank you, Mayor. Uh -huh. All right, give it up for Mayor Walsh and Mayor Benjamin. Unbelievable job. How was that march? How many of you marched today? Come on, let me see your hands. Mayor Couch, she's over there. Mayor Ames. Anyway, thank you so much. So who's excited to go to Burning Man? Come on, you guys. We only have a few RSVPs left, but it is fantastic. And it totally changed my mind on arts and culture and perception. In my region, it brings in $70 million of economic impact. So I don't want to scare you, because a lot of people are like, Hillary, do we have to go out there and camp and you know, dress up kind of crazy and don't worry, mayors, I got it all handled for you. We're only going to go take a tour for a half day, so, um, so nothing to be afraid of. But I'd love for you to come to my city, see what Burning Man is about. It is truly miraculous. It's a city that erects. It's just like every city with, um, with fire and safety and infrastructure. And it's, it's truly unbelievable. So I hope you take advantage of this opportunity. August 28th and 29th, we only have a few RSVPs left. Uh, when you walk out right outside here, there is an incredible art piece that many of you probably remember when I die and you sign it. Well, for mayors, when I leave office. So don't forget to sign it when you walk out because we're going to take it out on the playa and then we're going to burn it. What do you think? I know, these like, <laughs> what are you talking about, Mayor? But it is truly unbelievable. I hope you'll join me for, for our, our tapes committee in Reno, Nevada. You are going to be just blown away. Um, Marnie and Megan are here from Burning Man. Please stand up. Where are you, girls? So if you have any questions, 
They'll be happy to answer them, and we'll be waiting out here. I want every single mayor to join me out here, and when I leave office, I want to know what your vision is. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Mayor. And we hope that when we leave office and when we die are not the same day. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I hope many of you uh, can attend Burning Man uh, this year. Um, uh, don't forget to, uh, of course, sign the piece of Burning Man art located outside on the fourth floor. Um, it will be displayed, uh, as Hillary said, uh, this year. Um, so uh, the U.S. Conference of Mayors is proud to partner with Nationwide. Um, as a, we've had a relationship uh, that goes back decades. And as a USCM Platinum Partner Nationwide provides retirement plan services uh, for your cities and employees around the country, helping them plan and live comfortably in retirement. Uh, Mayors Nationwide can help your city employees save with confidence, help them prepared, prepare for retirement. Uh, to tell us more about Nationwide is Regional Vice President Jeffrey Francis. Jeffrey, please join me on the stage. Thank you. So collectively, I think I heard a little bit of a sigh. You think nationwide, you think some of our endorsement partners, you're looking for Leslie Odom, you're looking for Peyton Manning, and you got Jeff Francis. With that, I would like to just queue up a quick short video for you all to watch, and then I'll come back to you. Imagine if there were no barriers. What would you do? Anything? Everything? At Nationwide, we believe in removing barriers for all associates. Nationwide's initiative is called Associate Success Drives Business Success. It is enabled by the culture, which we are extremely proud of. But the components of that strategy include attracting, accelerating, and advancing. And we believe that those three working together has made a tremendous difference. Nationwide gives women access to challenging, high-profile assignments. And that's probably the single biggest thing that catapulted my career here. I'm a mother of three, and I've got children all the way from 23 to 10. And I can't say that there's been any time in my career at Nationwide that I have felt that being a woman or being a mother of having three children has been seen as a liability. Everybody has to come along. We, we aren't just looking for pieces of the company, we're looking for every part of the company, which meant we had to get more engaged in discussions around diversity, more engaged in discussions around our community. And all of that brings people along and makes them feel like they're not, as an individual, getting left behind because we're not talking to them. Nationwide has helped mold me the programs they offer, they help you intentionally focus on development. And, you know, I think one of the ways in which they've done that is through some of our associate resource programs. Um, we have 19 of them at Nationwide, and really it allows associates to have a forum to engage with associates that have something in common with them. Nationwide has seen tremendous results. So if you look at our company, we continue to grow, uh, not only in terms of our performance as a financially strong company, but also in terms of being a place where people want to come and work. You know, one of the things the board recognized very early was the need to increase women on our board and increase diversity on our board. And the reality now is that we will add a fifth woman board member to a 15-person outside board. And so I think it's a reflection of our desire to be sure we get the most rounded set of views and, and opportunities for voices to be in the room that would not be there otherwise. Our journeys serve as a role model for our children to say, you have the opportunities to dream, to succeed, to achieve. What would you become if there were no barriers? At Nationwide, you can achieve every career dream. So I'm proud to be a Nationwider, and one of the things that's always exciting to me is I walk into rooms, and oftentimes I hear that jingle at the end, and it comes with many different messages, whether that chicken parm tastes so good, 
or nationwide is is on your side but it's just an exciting exciting thing you know as a father to go home and, and be able to talk about what I do to a 15 year old son to talk about retirement plans right I'm not a football star I haven't won a World Series but to talk about retirement plans but then be able to talk about that mission and our values and how those align and I think about the United States Conference of Mayors and and hearing a lot of the the, the initiatives that have been going on in your cities and I think about the communities that we're collectively both serving, and I think about the alignment that's there between Nationwide's values and your values. And we have the privilege to work with many great cities, and a couple of them are, are here from Philadelphia to Baltimore uh, to recently to Scottsdale, and it's just an exciting time. And I would challenge you, if you don't know Nationwide, come get to know us a little bit. We're a different company. We're an American company. We're not a company that is publicly traded, so our sole mission is to serve our members, and those members are folks that are, are your employees, participants in our programs. And when we think about Nationwide, we, we talk about diversity and inclusion, as, as you heard in that video, and that can mean lots of different things. But from an internally within Nationwide, the one message that you get is our employees are engaged. And why does that matter? It matters because who's going to be taking the best care of your employees? A happy employee at Nationwide, as your, your employee is calling into our customer service line or your employee is sitting down with one of our retirement specialists, is going to be in the best position because they're engaged, they're happy, and they're proud to be with Nationwide. And so with that, I just want to conclude by saying thank you for this long-term partnership. We're looking forward to the future and the great opportunities together to build on this legacy of retirement for the employees of the cities across America. Thank you so much. Jeff, thank you nationwide again for your support of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, our next item is a panel discussion, an incredibly important issue, the 2020 census as we prepare uh, for this important uh, period um, that we handle every decade. I'm going to be handing the stage over to our moderator, um, Mayor Catherine Pugh of Baltimore and chair of our census task force. Um, please welcome uh, the dynamic mayor of Baltimore, Maryland, Catherine Pugh. Let's give our president a big round of applause. Isn't he doing a great job? Thank you, Mr. President. And we really do appreciate the strong leadership and support that the U.S. Conference of Mayors has given to the 2020 Census. Let me just remind you all that it was in 1750, under then State Secretary Thomas Jefferson, that the first U.S. Census took place. We've had 22 such censuses since then. I want to welcome you to this panel discussion preparing for the 2020 Census. And as chair of this task force, I feel it is our duty to make sure we're all doing whatever we can to make sure that our communities are prepared for a full and accurate count of every person, of every person, you all want to say that with me, of every person residing in our cities. It is now less than two years before April the 1st, which will be the start date of our next census. And much remains to be done, and we need to make sure that all of our communities are ready. This past April in Baltimore, our committee met and deliberated over some of the issues that are still in front of us. We have a great panel of speakers lined up this afternoon and for the next few minutes, we would like to focus on some of the critical issues facing our cities and just share a few ideas in terms of what we're thinking as the issues that still need to be addressed. Many of you will recall this year we sent a joint letter signed by 161 mayors to the Commerce, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross. Give yourselves a big round of applause. We express our concerns about this upcoming census. We have yet to receive a response, and we remain concerned about three specific issues. The administration and Congress providing adequate funding to conduct the 2020 census. Number two, 
the top leadership position at the Census Bureau is still not filled. And number three, we are gravely concerned that the Department of Commerce decided to, as you all well know, add that very unwise citizenship question to this upcoming census. On funding, we know that fiscal year 2019 is a pivotal year leading up to the 2020 census. The Census Bureau must finalize the 2020 census operational plan and complete all census preparation, including ensuring that our IT systems, readiness, and security, opening up all of our local census offices, hiring 76,000 canvassers to verify the master address list, and launching early communication activities targeting hard to reach communities. We don't want an undercount. To conduct these activities and bolster funding for additional necessary initiatives, the U.S. Conference of Mayors and other census stakeholders recommend that the U.S. Census Bureau appropriate at least $4.7 billion to spend in FY 2019. On leadership, the Census Bureau has been without a permanent director for almost a year. At a Senate Appropriations Committee hearing last month, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross told members of the committee that he has, spent, he has sent a name to the White House for consideration. No one knows who the candidate is, and it is troubling that this recommendation was made with no consultation with stakeholders or any scientific association. On the citizenship question, a few months ago, the Department of Commerce decided to add an untested citizenship question to the upcoming census. We, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and most stakeholders believe it should seriously, it will, be ser it will seriously undermine efforts to achieve what all of us want, a full count and an accurate count. That's why we joined a multi-state lawsuit to block the question from being added to the upcoming survey form. A few points. A few points about this question. To say it is a bad question is an understatement. To say it's bad for our communities is an understatement. To say it is bad for America is an understatement. It is a bad question. It is a wrong question. It is a question that does not belong on the upcoming census. Asking every person in this country about their citizenship status in this current political environment when there is no legal basis or need to do so will cause panic and result in hundreds of thousands of people in our communities avoiding the census for fear of being targeted by this administration. This politically driven citizenship question compromises the Census Bureau's constitutional responsibility to conduct a fair and accurate count of every person, of every person living in these United States. Census data are the basis for fair political representation. Local community leaders use the data to make decisions about how we allocate resources for our communities such as education, where to build new schools, housing, law enforcement, transportation, and job training. There has been a bipartisan mainstream alarm and opposition to the Commerce Department's unwise decision, and we remain committed to helping them make the right decision. From a wide range of census stakeholders, including 60 members of the U.S. Congress, 161 of us, Democratic 
and Republican mayors, six former census directors who served in both Republican and Democratic administrations, 19 attorney generals, the statistical community, and several dozen business leaders from across this nation. We will use every available tool to ensure that the Census Bureau can conduct an accurate count, including litigation and legislation. Congress has the power to fix this problem, and we will continue to urge lawmakers to act. So now I will introduce to you our panel that will shed some light on where we are, what they're doing in their cities, and how this issue is important to all of us. First, we will hear from Ashley Allison. She is the Executive Vice President of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. She will discuss the Leadership Conference's position on this issue and update us on where we stand with key lawsuits that have been filed to block the citizenship question. And then you will hear from our distinguished mayors, San Jose Mayor Sam Licardo, and Seattle Mayor is going to join us, Jenny Durkin. They will discuss how the citizenship question is likely to impact their cities, and certainly some of you out there, and what they are doing to help ensure a full and accurate count in light of this current situation. So again, thank you all for understanding how important this is for all of us and how this census determines the resources that we will have to do what needs to be done in all of our cities. So we will begin with Ashley Allison. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think you did an excellent job summarizing the whole state of play. Um, but I can dig a little deeper in terms of some of the solutions that we think are paths forward for the citizenship question. Um, and also, thank you to the US Conference of Mayors for having us on this panel. The Leadership Conference is a nonprofit organization of over 200 civil and human rights organizations. And we have prioritized the census as one of the most important civil rights issues that our country is facing right now. As the mayor explained, in March, um, Secretary Ross added a citizenship question that has been untested and unnecessary. Um, for the last eight years, the, uh, the Census Bureau has been doing research and testing on how different individuals will respond to different questions on the census to ensure a fair and accurate count. This question did not, was not a part of that research. Right now in Rhode Island, there is something called an end-to-end -end test, which is um, basically a trial run with the new technology that the census will be deploying because this will be the first high-tech census where individuals can fill out their form online. So right now, this test is taking place, and the citizenship question is not a part of this end-to-end -end test. So the data that we're gonna get back from April 1st until its conclusion in August will be invalid because we won't actually get to see how people are responding um, to the question on the census, uh, which is just by the baseline a reason enough not to include the question. But it is there now, and so there are a couple pathways for it for it to be removed, one through litigation, one through Congress, but there's also um, a civic engagement component to this uh, that I wanna talk a little bit about. So right after the question was announced by Secretary Ross in March, uh, we're at six lawsuits now, but the California state's attorney filed a lawsuit. U.S. Conference of Mayors, thank you for your leadership on this, joined the New York Attorney General in filing a lawsuit along with six cities. Um, a group of individuals from Maryland and Arizona have filed lawsuits. Um, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under law have filed lawsuits in federal court with California along with the Black Alliance for Just Immigration and MALDEF and Amer Asians Americans Advancing Justice have filed lawsuits along on behalf of 21 different organizations that all oppose the citizenship question. The lawsuits basically are questioning the constitutionality of this question as well as claims against the Administrative Procedures Act. 
that says that you can add arbitrary or capricious, uh, make arbitrary decisions to um, federal, federal um, implementation of different things. So that might be regulations or it might be something like the census. Um, and then just recently, the ACLU filed another lawsuit which has a similar claim, but also has a claim on intentional demonstration under the Equal, Protect, or Equal Protection Clause. So these litiga this litigation is all pending. In New York, the Department of Justice filed a motion to dismiss. We think that the court will be ruling on that by the end of this month. Many organizations are filing um, briefs to say that that motion to dismiss should not be uh, upheld. Um, so the question is still out there on to whether or not litigation will be the pathway forward. And then I, sorry. Yeah, so one of the things I think we would like to know is how long do we have to litigate this question? And at what point do we get to say uh, that we don't get a response? If we don't get a response, if we don't win litigation, uh, where does that leave us? Mm -hmm. And when is the last time that a, a lawsuit can be filed that would help us to change this? What's that period of time we're talking about? So the good thing is, is that the census isn't until April 1st, 2020. So we do have some time to, fit, to take different pathways to so solutions. So right now, we believe that we should <coughs> hold off on Congress trying to find a solution on this until the courts make it, have an opportunity to make a decision. After that, these six the six lawsuits will be on a rolling basis. The judges, it's at their discretion on when they'll make their ruling, but some of them are, are starting to come down as early as this month. Um, once the, the court rules, other lawsuits can be filed for other legal clause or claims all the way up until April 1st of 2020. After that, depending on what happens, if the question is removed or not, other litigation can be filed under different legal claims. So this will be an ongoing battle unless after this first round of litigation happens, if, it is, if the question is not removed through any of these lawsuits, Congress can then step in and act and it can be settled by, at that point. But right now, folks are holding off to see what the courts are saying um, in the House and Senate. Mm -hmm. One other piece I wanna just flag is that uh, yesterday, um, the Census Bureau under the Federal Register posted a notice where people can submit comments about how they are, how they want to respond, what they think the validity of the citizenship question is. So each of you can actually go to regulations.gov and submit a comment on behalf of your city directly to the Commerce Secretary, directly to the Census Bureau saying why you actually think this question will, uh, depress the count, and I strongly encourage all of you to do that. If you want information on how to do that, you can email me at ashley at civilrights.org, and we will be more than willing to provide that information. Okay. Thank you, so now we'll go to, to our mayors. We're gonna hear from Sam Licardo first, and then um, Jenny Durkin will hear from you. So well, how does the question impact sure. the outcomes for your cities? Well, first I wanna thank you, Mayor Pugh, for your leadership, and thank Ashley for her advocacy. Uh, the city of San Jose, and I know we're not alone in this room, and, and me being able to say in our community, we believe that everyone counts. Uh, and I know uh, that is what animated the first article of the US Constitution uh, and its creation. Unfortunately, that value is not universally shared, at least not in our commerce, commerce department, unfortunately. Uh, and so uh, in the city of San Jose, we have a very high immigrant population. Uh, about 40% of us were born in a foreign country, about half of our immigrants are citizens, half are not. It means approximately 80,000 undocumented immigrants. So this is a, an issue that goes right to the core of our city and, and our values. Uh, we think our diversity is the secret sauce of our success. Uh, we're the high, city with the highest per capita income in the country, the second lowest violent crime rate, uh, and yes, a city of immigrants. And so uh, we want to ensure we continue to be a city of immigrants. Uh, we have taken basically a two-pronged approach what I'll call the swords and the plowshares approach. The swords, uh, since I'm a former, I guess, recovering attorney, uh, decided we, we would file a lawsuit very early on. So with Washington, D.C., we were one of the first two cities to file a lawsuit against the Trump administration because we think we have a fairly unique story to tell. Uh, but secondly, uh, in terms of plowshares, we think there are solutions to help us at least boost the numbers to something closer to what we know the truth to be. 
Uh, we've worked really collaboratively with Cities of Service and other organizations to see how we can get, with the help of a lot of nonprofit organizations that have a lot of trust in the community, that have linguistic and cultural competency, uh, to be able to engage people, more people in our community to help us identify how we can uh, ensure that every family is counted. In a city as expensive as San Jose, and I know Seattle is in a similar boat, we've got a lot of families doubling up and a lot of people living in what we might call unconventional housing. Uh, so we've uh, adopted a, uh, a tool, uh, an SMS texting data collection tool, uh, combined with a lot of uh, just sweat labor from a lot of nonprofit organizations hitting the, the streets to identify all those garages that have been converted, all the RVs, all the places where people are living, but the census isn't likely to count them. And by uh, utilizing this data, uh, we are now expanding uh, through the LUCA program, the database of all the potential locations where census should be counting, and we're gonna hold them to it. So do you believe that um, you've had to add additional cost uh, with these new areas that you're looking at? Um, how much is it costing your city? and how far are you along in terms of being prepared for 2020? Well, uh, we are investing hundreds of thousands of dollars in this year's budget, about 400,000. The county is matching us with more than a million dollars. Uh, but up to this date, we've actually spent very little. Uh, the SMS texting tool, which we're happy to share with, with any other city, uh, is something that can really be used in engagement with, with nonprofits that are simply willing to assist and help, uh, and we can do that with very low cost. Now, the rest of it we know in terms of really amping up the public messaging is more challenging because uh, like many of our cities, we've got a lot of very scared residents who are concerned about uh, ICE and, and deportation, and many of them are being told by our nonprofits, don't open the door uh, if someone says they're from the government knocking on the door. And so we've got to find more nuanced ways uh, to be able to keep people safe and still get them counted. Jenny, what's happening in Seattle? Yeah, we're very similarly placed, and I, again, want to thank you, Mayor, for your leadership on this, and thank you to the conference for always being at the front edge there. Um, and we're doing very much similar to San Jose. We're trying to go on various fronts. So we also filed a lawsuit related to the, to the citizenship question, joined with the other six cities, and are pushing forward on that front to make sure that the questions are fair. But let me talk a little bit also about why it's important for Seattle, and I'm sure each of you can evaluate your own city. So in 2010, at the last census, Seattle has population was 610,000 and change. We've added over 100,000 residents and have grown almost 19% in 10 years. Mm. So if we don't get to those people and count them, it will affect our ability to get federal money. Um, and Washington State was able to get a fair amount of money, but with our growth, we know to do it. And sometimes it's the hardest to count because the deleterious effects of what the immigration policy has been in cities is exactly that, the confidence of people in uh, government employees who show up at the door is diminished. It suppresses that organization. The other thing is I would urge you to look right now, if you can go online and comment, one of the things that the Department of Commerce has said is it is going to reduce and maybe eliminate in some cities the canvassers who go door to door to actually find and count people and rely instead on online and mail. Well, we know that that will suppress the numbers in almost every urban area and in small towns as well. And so we're joining with a number of nonprofits. I'm going to be announcing a task force to look to see, to get all the various groups involved. And I'm fortunate because former Secretary of Commerce Gary Locke lives in Seattle, so I'm recruiting him. He ran the last census because we know they'll undercount. But what are we good at? Every mayor, we stood for election. We know how to go door to door, and community groups know how to go to door, and we can get trusted messengers. So in addition to all the other avenues, we're looking at how do we make sure that we use counting capabilities. I'm very interested in this SMS message, but to make sure that we have trusted community partners who can evaluate and have a program where we fan out and do our own canvassing and make sure that people are counted. So have you looked at the additional costs for your, your city? We're just starting to look right now. We don't think it'll be that much additional cost for because we really are gonna engage the existing networks, but it will significantly cost our city if we don't count people.
because the amount of federal funding we will lose through block grants and the like, which we desperately need, will diminish incredibly. So we know that the small investment we can make now will pay off for us as a city. So has, um, for the mayors, have you looked at the impact of an undercount in your city and have you devised tools, you talked about SMS, have you devised tools and ways by which you can assure that you get an accurate count? The, the, the undercount for us, even back when we had an administration that was census friendly in 2010, uh, we believe the census missed about 68,000 San Jose residents. We're a city of a little more than a million. Uh, the cost to our city and federal resources, housing, education, so forth, approximately $200 million over a decade. Uh, so these costs are very real. It's absolutely worth the upfront investment. We all know all of our budgets are tight, uh, but we should spend whatever we need to in order to get the word out. And our immigrant population is growing faster than our normal population. We're, people are coming to Seattle from everywhere. And it's the same thing. We know that if we don't count them, we will be severely undercounting our population and therefore access to those dollars that help us get the essential services. So I echo what the mayor says, that this is really an investment that every city, no matter what your size, make sure people get counted. Because, you know, if they don't count, they don't count. Can I add one yeah, thing, though, just on the cause? The Census Bureau says that um, for every 1% decrease in self-response rate, it will increase the cost, how much it costs to count by $55 million. 1% decrease. Mm -hmm. um, and the amount of enumerators that they had in 2010 were 300,000 compared to approximately just under 100,000 for this count. So, Ashley, if you were advising cities as it relates to the lawsuit, um, what is your advice to us as cities? How long should we be waiting? Should we be joining lawsuits, those who have not joined? And uh, what should be our next steps as a U.S. Conference of Mayors? We've, we've signed the position, posi um, we, we have signed uh, our petition, we've sent it forward, we've not gotten a response. What should be our next steps? The first thing I would do would be submit a comment on regulations.gov to the Census Bureau as an individual mayor, letting them know the impact it will have on your city. The second thing I would do if you are interested is consider the, out, the lawsuits that are pending and decide to, if you wanna join as a city and we can help connect you to some of the nonprofits that are already litigating their, these cases. Many of them are members of the leadership conference. And the third thing I would do is talk to your uh, Congress men and women and your senators and let them know that we need complete fund we need a fully funded census we need to close the uh, leadership vacuum that is currently housed at the census with someone who believes in a fair and accurate census not someone who will continue to depress the count and that they need to act to remove the citizenship question and then finally i would say um, in terms of activating nonprofits to begin to do some research on forming a complete count committee in your city which can help bring nonprofits um, and the mayor's office and your police chiefs and all the individuals together to start having conversations on how to actually get a, a fair and accurate count. Yeah. And Mayor, let me, can I just add two things to that? I think it's really important while you do that to make sure you have both the cultural and language competence. Absolutely. You know, in Seattle, about 20% or more of our, our people who live there don't speak English. And we have 129 languages that are spoke. So making sure you have that competence to do it. And the second thing is, don't just think about your city. You know, Seattle is tied to a lot of other towns in our region, and if the whole region doesn't count right, it will affect everybody's economy. So I'd really encourage you to reach out to the other mayors in your region and band together on it. I'd like to ask another question for all of our mayors because this is a conversation that we had a little bit earlier, and you shared it with us in Seattle about the homeless population. How are you making sure that that population is counted? I think that's a great question, and we've been kind of on a very forward-leaning track in terms of making sure they're counted for other purposes. So registering to vote, um, giving them a place to vote, letting them cast a provisional ballot if they can't. And that's the groundwork by which you can make sure they get counted for census purposes. So we, we are very um, conscious about knowing who's in our city, uh, living on our streets and how do we give them the services they need and as we do that count them for other purposes too. As part of our local update to the census address we're actually identifying the sheds that people are living in literally um, the cars on the street because 
we know often those are not as mobile as you might think they are. People are staying there for months and years at a time. Ashley, best advice you want to give this group? Get everyone counted. <laughs> Knock on every single door, but start now. The work is being done right now. Um, we're building coalitions across every state. Some states we don't have a lead right now. If you want to help identify someone in your city, the leadership conference will be more than happy to be your ally because we will fight every day to ensure a, a fair and accurate census, but we have to do the work now. And canvassers, recruiting canvassers, how do we go about doing that? It's really, uh, nonprofit organizations are such critical uh, partners in all of this, both for the competency they provide, uh, but also because they are trusted in the community when the government's not. And Any it strikes me that maybe the conference can actually, you know, when we share these experiences, put a toolkit up on the website that cities can log into and take which parts of it are gonna work for them. Um, because different towns, different cities are gonna need different things, but the key is, it's fundamental to what America is that every person is counted. So let's give our panel a big round of applause. And, and let me just finally say, as a chair of the U.S. Census uh, for Committee for this body, I want you to know that we're gonna be doing everything we can, one, to push out information to each of you all in terms of the progress of the lawsuits, uh, on the questions that have been addressed here, and the question that we feel should not be on the census. Because our goal at the U.S. Conferences of Mayors and all of you all in all of your jurisdictions is to make sure that every citizen is counted. Thank you all. Thank you, committee. And so I'm going to ask our president to come on back out. I'm going to turn this program back over to you. I hope you all found this conversation to be of some value. Mr. President, we'll continue to do the work. Thank you so much, Mayor Pugh, and our fantastic panel, fantastic panel. Um, now, just to recap the uh, rest of the afternoon for you, from 2.45 to 4.30, there will be a site visit to Boston's fifth quarter uh, of learning uh, initiative at Franklin, at Franklin Park Zoo. And uh, from 245 to 345, there'll be a best practice forum on how cities and foundations can work together to achieve community goals and another address in city strategies to reduce gun violence. Um, also from 245 to 345, there will be three task force meetings, uh, technology and innovation, uh, trilateral alliance for trade in the Americas and opportunities uh, to address safety and the well-being of seniors. Uh, the Women's Mayors Leadership Alliance of the U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, will have a plenary session right here in this room from 4 o'clock to 5.15 this afternoon. And the Standing Committee on Tourism, Arts, Parks, Entertainment, and Sports will be meeting this evening from 5.30 to 6 p.m. At 5.45, we're going to kick off a, a special reception honoring this wonderful group, uh, a host of New England mayors. Uh, and finally, tonight, we're going to have our evening at the Seaport World Trade Center and a late night event nearby a district hall in the Innovation District. So buses are going to start departing at 6.15 and will be available for return back to the hotel after each and every uh, event. So with that, thank you all so much. Uh, we're adjourned. <laughs>